So we're living in a political environment right now. We're watching political commercials on TV. We'll hear one that comes from the Trump folks. We'll hear one that comes from the Biden folks. From commercial to commercial, from stump to stump, from words to words, it doesn't change a whole lot. Trump hasn't said anything lately that I haven't already heard him say about a hundred million times. What about y'all? Biden hasn't said anything too new. So that what they're doing is they're just sort of drumming into us, you know, these things, they, they're, they're, they're these points, you know. Uh, they canceled one debate. They didn't want to do it. Now they're going to have another one, but that's going to be in person. Uh, that's going to be interesting, that last debate. You think it's going to be any different? You think, you think they're going to stop interrupting one another? Or I don't know. I think they need to let King Kong moderate it, and that, that would be that thing. But, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that, is that you know, from, from whether you hear one of the speeches that Biden does or Trump does, whether they're in Minnesota or Florida or Ohio, it doesn't change that much, you know? It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a familiar message, you know? Well, I would actually, believe it or not, compare that to Jesus' parables. That he is not trying, every time he talks to the people, he's not trying to address them with brand new information. It's almost as if, you know, he's sort of like our politicians. He tells us what he's already told us, and he tells it in a different way again, 99 different ways, right? You know? And, and that, that's a way of communication. Uh, like I said, uh, a lot of these parables, and when I got started with them way back early summer, you know, uh, it does, there for a couple of Sundays, come across as sort of saying the same thing, only different. And that gets boring, you know. That's my challenge, I know. But after a little while, I figure I didn't hit you in the same spot on the head. Boom! Yeah, you got a knot right there. And then next Sunday, it's like, well, there's that same knot. Boom! I hit you again on it. You got a double knot now. And then next Sunday, it's sort of the same knot. Boom! And that's about the time I decided to go to the Old Testament and tell you something where I can hit you in a different place. I understand what I mean by that. I, I, I speak in parables, too. It's not literal. But like I say, listen to this parable. This parable, if it were a real event, it ain't fair. It's just not. I'll show you what it means in a minute. So let's read it. Matthew 22, begin with the first verse, 1 through 14. Even the writer of Matthew is sort of getting tired of his telling parables because look, it's not really there in the English, but it is in the original. But you see where it says, once more Jesus spoke to them in parables. <laughs> Here you go again. Yeah, here we go again. One more, once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, remember that every one of these parables starts with these words, the kingdom of heaven may be compared. Every single one that we've read so far started that way. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. So it starts sounding like that vineyard parable about right now. Now, at the vineyard parable, remember, it's at this point that Jesus asked the question. He says, uh, now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And then they start suggesting. Notice in this parable, Jesus doesn't ask what the owner's going to do. Listen to this. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to 
who is slave. The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. I don't even know what that means. There's a good wedding uh, person and a bad wedding guest, right? Is that what that means? Both the good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with good wedding guests and bad wedding guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It don't exactly have a happy ending, does it? Because then Jesus asked to destroy what? For many are called, but few are chosen. That doesn't make me smile. It's getting down to the last words. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> so, throughout the New Testament, Jesus uses various imagery for the kingdom of God. Can you name a few? Mustard seed. Mm. Wheat and tares. Can you name a few? How are we to think about the kingdom of God? What things exist in our world that lend understanding to this concept of the kingdom of God. You know, last Sunday we saw where Jesus actually borrowed imagery from the Old Testament, from Isaiah, as he described the kingdom of God as a vineyard. We are keepers of the vineyard. We'll use that word here in Mississippi. We don't like it too much. We're, we're sharecroppers. Or I guess I could go for Paul's words. You know, I, 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 I told you you could say, you could use this, stewards of the mysteries. But we're not the owner, okay? So in today's text from Matthew 22, we have another favorite image for the kingdom of God. The banquet. Among the most joyous and festive feasts is the wedding banquet. Now, I don't know what kind of wedding you had. I don't know if you had groomsmen and flower girls and green bearers and people lined up all in flowers and candelabras and all, or whether you uh, elope. That's the cheap version, right? But I don't know what you know about Jewish weddings. And you may think, and I may think, that your wedding, or his wedding, or her wedding, or my daughter's wedding lasted too long. But it is, believe you me, nothing in comparison to a Jewish wedding. Because most Jewish weddings last for at least a week. Don't read about it. Very, very important. Always a celebration of profoundness Meaning among human beings. I mean, weddings, putting, you know, that, that's like carrying on the generations. In fact, the very identification of the kingdom of God with such a banquet. I mean, it says something very important about it. An understanding. The kingdom is the location of life's greatest joys. Life's greatest fulfillment. I mean, think about it. In it, we have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with the saints. In it, our light. We can say so much more. Perfect rest. Inexpressible happiness. Hmm. 
All part of it. It's the place for which every soul longs. Even if they don't know it. Even we mortals when we, we don't even know it today. Finding and knowing God is a thing of such great importance that nothing else can take its place for anyone. I really hope you believe that's true. I mean, because for what Jesus offers, to miss the kingdom is to miss everything. Therefore, entering the kingdom is a subject to which Jesus returns again and again and again. <coughs> well, I mean, we could talk about this for a while, but let's just hit the highlights. Jesus tells us amazing things about the kingdom. First of all, everybody is invited. All are invited. No one is excluded. I'm sure, still not sure that that's the mindset we think here. Secondly, admission is absolutely free. Yes, right there. The admission, the invitation. Now, maintaining our citizenship in this kingdom is and should be costly. But it's the price through the Holy Spirit that we are enabled to pay. We are glad to pay. But entrance, though, is ours for the asking. Third, admission is usually by way of invitation. I mean, somebody invites us. It's just that simple. I mean... Even if it goes all the way back, we, we may not even remember the invitation, especially if we first came into the kingdom in the arms of our parents. But it all happened by invitation. I mean, there's no royal decree. There's no order proclaimed from on high. God, like the king in the parable, operates only through people's free will. And you want to talk about a subject that we could talk about a long, long time. It's understanding exactly the free will that God offers. People, first of all, are free to spurn God. I mean, that's the freest freedom of all free will, is you can reject God. Like I said last Sunday, what? You can almost always turn God down. Now, we church folk, I mean, some of us have been going to this church, some of us longer than some of us here have been born, right? We church folk who labor in some little corner of the kingdom, we certainly see this. I mean, as our constituents and neighbors in large number go shoo, 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 pass by, passing up our best efforts, and we offer it to them, but they're in pursuits of something more that they value. Or you want me to say the same thing a different reason, a different way, a different understanding? Do you know why people come to church? Because they want to. You know why people don't come to church? Because they don't want to. That's it. But we who are in the kingdom business must always remember that we are, above all, inviters. You know, you, you put it in whatever perspective, whatever story, whatever comes across. You know, Jesus talks about being fishers of people, fishers of men. And yeah, you can get out of the net or a hook or however you want to catch people. But the real truth, the real word, we're inviters. We are inviters. Our job is to invite people. All people. Now, still, again, I don't know if that's in our mindset. And it's a serious business worth our best efforts. The stakes are high and the time is short. So, our text closes with this curious story of a man who is thrown into outer darkness simply because he doesn't happen to be wearing a wedding robe. 
And like I said, if this were a real event taking place, this wouldn't be very fair. I mean, you know, what's going on here? But this is Jesus' parable, so we've got to figure out what it means. But here's this guy who shows up. He doesn't have on his wedding clothes. I mean, it's sort of be like you or me picking somebody off the street uh, to say be one of our groomsmen up here. Hey, you want to, hey, we need an extra groomsman. Hey, hey, fella, you want to come in here and be a groomsman? Well, come right on up here. You can be number three right there. And he just happens to be wearing a tuxedo. Now, how many folks you going to find like that? So how are we to understand this? Well, you know how in Western society you always hear that saying, a sort of sexist, as the saying goes, clothes make the man. Right? Well, the folks of Jesus' day and time could absolutely identify with that saying. In fact, even in biblical imagery, clothing oftentimes signifies character or discipleship or something special. Remember at the Jesus' clothes turned white, remember? And again, we have to remember that these are parables. There's not, they're not literal events. And that, like I said, symbolism, applying the meaning of this, plays an important role. So, this man may remind us that although we are invited to come to the kingdom just as we are. And see, I believe in that, and I don't want folks to be confused, because I've used that myself. I've even sung, it's just like at the end of a Billy Graham crusade, you know, I, I understand. Want folks to come and be committed to Jesus? Do. And I'll sing that song, y'all ready? Just as I am without one. Yeah. But see, what I'm saying to you in a sense, when you look at this parable and you start to figure out what's going on, and you really get clicked into this, yes, sir, buddy, that song does work. One time. One time. This man reminds us is that although we are invited to come to the kingdom just as we are, there is a dress code inside the door. You know what I'm saying? We, hmm, let me say this nicely, we cannot apply for forgiveness every morning without giving up the shortcomings for which we beg pardon. Like I said, that's a nice way of saying you can't keep doing the same stupid sins over and over again. And get up every day of your life and go, well, I'll just ask for forgiveness and carry on. You know, a friend of mine attended what she called a blue jean service. And I said, a what? A blue jean service. And that sounds strange to us because some of us wear blue jeans every Sunday morning, don't we? But this friend of mine, she was, uh, she was in one of those big city churches, and they started them a blue jean service. And I don't know. I just, you know, I don't know about that. I understand. I mean, if such a service is aimed at the unchurched, and, you know, not everybody has a nice jacket and coat and tie and everything. I understand all of that. But the worshipers dress down. What you think about that? Food and drink are offered and are actually, I don't know if you ever uh, went up to the orchard up in Tupelo, went to one of the orchard services. And they did this kind of stuff. Food and drink carried into the worship area? Yeah. I mean, imagine sitting right there where you are Eating a donut, sitting in church. Well, on second thought, just don't imagine that. No. Anyway, my friend was startled to find herself beside what she called a local rowdy 
who was so stirred up by the pithy print music songs, you know, the praise music, that he sloshed hot, hot coffee on her. Well, it wasn't a very worshipful event for her. She didn't like being as judgmental as it was making her feel, but she beheld his giddy exuberance with mixed feelings. She wondered if he was simply playing a frivolous game with the grace of God. For you see, as the parable tells us, and I don't want to say this, like I said, this parable doesn't exactly have a happy ending now, does it? But the parable tells us there are those who momentarily make it to the inside who are worthy only of the outer darkness. Did y'all hear that? There are a few folks who are actually going to make it to the inside who are worthy of outer darkness. And you know, she also wondered how well equipped her little church was to guide this fellow who obviously had other problems to a higher level of discipleship. John Wesley, who was a very smart man, y'all, God read some of the stuff. He wrote about lots of different things. Listen to a quote, and I promise you, you have never heard this quote before. John Wesley warned, never encourage the devil by snatching souls from him that you cannot nurture. Never encourage the devil by snatching souls from him that you cannot nurture. See, if there's a subject about which Matthew is deadly serious, it's God's judgment. For Matthew, Christians as well as pagans, you could find yourself in outer darkness. In fact, Jesus' words here, if you're really paying attention, are to the insiders. That's who he's talking to. Yes, there is a dress code in the kingdom. We may come to the kingdom just as we are. But we who refuse to don, we who refuse to put on the garments of righteousness are no better off than those who didn't show up. Because how does Jesus end this thing? What's his good news at the end of this thing? What does he say? I don't even like to say it. This is some serious stuff, isn't it? For many are called, but few 